In association with the faster than ever Boil Sports app, multiples made easy and personalised content on every sport. Download it now. Boil Sports. Time to play. I'm prepared to end it if I can. Do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Well, the big news this evening in the world of football is that Celtic will not be in the Champions League this season as Will was just mentioning. They've lost 2-1 over in Athens in the third round of qualifying for the competition. Uh, the Greek side progressed on an aggregate score of 3-2. It's been a frustrating few weeks for Brendan Rodgers and a host of fronts. The news this evening, Boyata refused to travel. He had been at the centre, it seemed, of a bid from Fulham for £7, eight, nine million pounds and that was uh, refused. Boyata wasn't too happy with that, said he couldn't make this game due to fitness issues. And then Rogers, in an interview on BT Sport just before the game, said he was 100% fit and he should be playing. So he's got that little situation to sort out very soon. And now, instead of a Champions League season to look forward to, it's Europa League and they have to make it through a playoff round there. So really bad evening in Athens for Celtic. We'll have more on that, I'm sure, later on in the show. And certainly tomorrow as well, we might do a piece on Celtic and tricky few weeks for Brennan Rodgers. Later on tonight, we will most certainly hear about the impact Marcelo Bielsa is making at Leeds. Uh, first though, Harry Arter. So I spoke with Harry Arter earlier on this afternoon. And as I'm sure you've seen, he's made the decision to leave Bournemouth. He's been there since 2010, had an unbelievable uh, career time there really, in many ways joined in 2010 when they were still in League One and we all know what's happened since. He was their player of the year when he got them up from, or was part of the team that got them up from the championship, obviously. Great relationship with Eddie Howe, but he has decided to join Neil Warnock's Cardiff. And it's pretty obvious, really. First team football is the objective. Basically, Harry hasn't played for Bournemouth post-Christmas in any real respect, certainly not in the Premier League. So I first asked him, given everything that was going on, when he figured that he wanted to move away from Bournemouth. It'd been in, uh, it'd been in my mind for, you know, best part of the summer to, to be honest with you um, and it was just trying to wait for the right opportunity I wanted to try you know and stay in the Premier League that was quite important to me but um, you know location as well for a long time so long term sort of move was, was important at, at that time but more the window went on and, and um, the way the way the market was you know uh, I knew um, Cardiff come about quite late um, along with a couple of other teams um, but for just some reason, it just felt just felt right to go to Cardiff. Um, I made my mind up quite quickly after learning their interest, and mm. and from that point on, I, I was really looking forward to it. How does it work in the modern day? Is it just all through your agent, or would somebody like Neil Warnock give you a call? No, it was done. It was done through my agent. He just he just gave me a call and said, you know, how do you feel about? Um, going to Cardiff on loan I, I think Bournemouth are uh, uh, happy to let you go on loan for a season mm. um, and I was like yeah that sounds sounds great it's that simple to be honest with you um, so you didn't feel you didn't, you didn't feel oh well let me talk to Warnock and let me see what the plans are or where he wants to play me any of that stuff you kind of said well let's go for it yeah I, I, I watched Cardiff last year and I, I thought the, the togetherness um, and the honesty from the manager that was pretty obvious to see from the outset and I thought the sort of club where you know I, I can probably bring my experiences with Bournemouth um, and share you know similar stories and similar experiences that I had there going to Cardiff because I think you know being around the bush most of uh, the public and the pundits uh, are writing them writing us off this year and yeah. assuming we'll go down and it was exactly the same when we got promoted with Bournemouth so um, you know we. I feel like I'll be able to add a good experience in that sense of the team and uh, I was really looking forward to it. Yeah, uh, not to put like too blunt a point on it, but where did it kind of go wrong last season, if that's the right way of phrasing the question? It seemed like the first half of the year, just having a look back at the stats there before speaking to you, you were playing a good bit before Christmas and then post-Christmas, first team opportunities seemed to dry up. Did anything in particular happen? You know what? There was no no sort of falling out or or anything drastic. To be honest with you, it was a case of you know the manager trying new players that had been waiting for a long time to get their opportunity. Yeah. Um, you know, at that time there wasn't any new players really that he'd brought in that took my place, um, and it just felt like the team needed a change in midfield and. Um, 
a it's a harsh it is a harsh business football when it comes to that side of it because yeah. Me and the manager have got a good bond, obviously, through through what we've achieved, uh, you know, together. And as a club, I've achieved so much of them. Um, and probably, I've uh, probably dealt with that that situation probably not as good as I would if I was in that position now. Um, and then I picked up a couple of injuries, and, and then the season just, you know, kind of finished for me quite early on, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, and I'll say I was really looking forward to for the for the for the season to end in all honesty and, and just regroup and, and get fit and, and see where pre season took me. Yeah. When you say you might deal with that situation better now, how did you deal with it at the time? Well I just feel, you know, my personality is quite a big one at Bournemouth and I've never ever not played there, yeah. to be honest with you. I can count on one hand before before this season how many times I sat on the bench and um the manager and and, and uh, you know the lads. They were they were all thankful for for my my attitude towards the situation. I, di- I didn't let my frustrations um, you know lead into the team in a, in a negative way. But just just for myself, uh, I was very unhappy in myself. Mm. I wasn't happy not playing. I'm, I'm someone that you know worked very hard to get to the Premier League. But if I'm not playing there, it doesn't make a difference to me that I'm in the in the Premier League. I've I've been used to playing League One. I've played in the non-league, and mm. and playing football is is my everything. So um, you know, I found it hard to to come away from football and and be happy to be totally honest with you. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine, and it's just kind of miserable. And especially, you know, a big game on Saturday. You're, everyone's training away Wednesday, Thursday, looking forward to the game, and deep down, you know, you're probably not going to be playing. That just takes five percent off you, I'd say, as well. Yeah, and that, that's where when I say I, if in, in the future I'd probably deal with it a tad differently. Um, you know, you kind of get the sense if the lads, you know, win on the weekend, and uh, you know you're not going to play the next weekend. And it was kind of a snowball effect of that for for a while. Um, the lads went on a really good run, and you kind of feel like you know you're not going to get a look in for a while now. And you know, naively that was probably my way of looking at it because in football it can change. You know, in the blink of an eye. Mm people suffer injuries and and whatever so um, as I say uh, the manager was you know really complimentary of my attitude around the place and and so were the lads because ultimately the lads that were playing in front of me were the ones that were watching me for the last three four years and they showed me that respect when I was playing and I was I was more than determined to to show them show that back to them yeah but just I know deep down when I come away from football and, and leading up to, to the following week, if I knew I wasn't going to play, I found that quite difficult. Yeah, no doubt. Did you have a relationship with Eddie Howe where you might go and knock on his door occasionally, say, look, is there anything I can do to get back in the team? Or do you kind of feel, well, look, there's no point doing that? Um, yeah, initially it was, you know, kind of them sort of conversations. And then as the week's gone on, they, you know, they, they end up becoming a bit repet- repetitive. So, yeah. Um, you end up just coming away from the situation and, and just waiting, really. And that's probably what what was doing my head in more than anything. And I looked at this season uh, coming. Obviously, we signed uh, a new midfielder for you know a big chunk of money. So, um, I, I, manager, not not once has he ever said to me he wants me to go or you have to go. Like I've heard in in some situations at some clubs, there was no freezing out or anything silly like that. I played in all the preseason games and. Um, it was just a, a decision, you know, kind of on the on the day. To be honest with you, it was. Yeah. I want to be involved. I want to be playing, and I can't afford to have another season like the one just gone. And um, I respect the manager's honesty. He couldn't promise that wasn't going to be the situation, and that's what the the. the made me made that decision yeah so I guess life gets a bit mad then and manic and deadline day happens you make the move and it's is it, is it it's open sticks and everyone to Cardiff kind of thing on the day it was literally just you know I drove from Bournemouth up to up to Cardiff it was it just on my on myself to do the medical and um, you know you, you're driving up I was driving up on my own and not for one minute did I ever think I, I, you know I'm not going to do this but there you know, there was part of me that was thinking it's a shame to, to be leaving Bournemouth in this way. Um, but then you understand that that's how football works. Mm. As I said earlier, it is a is a harsh a harsh business in that sense. Um, and I know for me, the number one thing in my life is other than family is, is football. So um, I'm, I'm just to say, yeah, honestly, very excited just to yeah. to get the season going. 
And I guess, I, so I mean, it's clear from talking to you that breaking into that Cardiff first team is very much the aim. I, I'm not as familiar with the Cardiff team. Is there big competition there? Is it something you feel if you play well, you'll be in the team? Yeah, I think, you know, the manager's made some good signings in midfield. He signed a uh, Spanish lad from, you know, Real Betis. That's uh, funny enough, played against him uh, last week or the week before in a pre-season game and he was he was probably the best player on the pitch that night. So, uh, added on top of that, the, the midfielders, they, they've already got there. It's, it's going to be, you know, a tough competition uh, for places. Um, but I feel confident that, you know, if I get given my chance, um, you know, I'll take it and hopefully play a big part in, in the season. Yeah, I guess from afar, we don't appreciate sometimes just how difficult it is and just how high the standard is. Because I saw a really brilliant quote from you last year and you were talking about all the players who arrive in the Premier League. It's very much a global league now. And you were saying, you know, back in the past, I used to see top clubs paying big money to bring in foreign midfielders. And there was a thought in my mind that I could do as good a job as them if I got a chance at a big club. But then you said, but I've changed my mind on that now. He says, when you play against some of these guys, they are on a different level. There are some talented sportsmen in the world. Some are just born bigger and better than you might have been. Some of the guys you come up against in the Premier League are just massive physically and so gifted as well. Um, which yeah. is kind of just an insight into into the level where, like, I mean, you, like even just physically, someone like Paul Pogba, you're just like that. Yeah. That, that is just a dogfight already. That you're you're the lesser in. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I I still back that up now because um, you look at some of the players that you know are brought in, especially to the top six clubs, yeah. um, and there's some unbelievable players. But one thing I I will say is I don't think that 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 is completely fair on on the British and the Irish market if you look at it. You know, this summer um, it was it was really poor for for English and, and Irish and, and you know the the players that have been brought up in this in this sort of uh, part of the world it was it was quite poor because um, you know Wolves and Fulham uh, two clubs that stick out that you know they went crazy with their signings and you kind of scratch your head and think you know if it works then you know brilliant but if it doesn't then you know why not why not give that chance to uh, you know, for the players that got you promoted, for example. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I do agree. Um, you know, the, the the money being spent on these players, you know, they've been watched, I'm sure, for you know months and months before these teams. So, you know, I have no problem when players come in and you know clubs spend massive amounts of money on them. Yeah, if they feel that's going to improve, you know, the club and it will drive the other players on at the club, then you know I'm all for that. Mm. So. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, when you, the first couple of months when you played in the Premier League, I presume it felt very, very fast and very, very technical. To some extent, you just must, must be a bit more used to it now. Yeah, yeah, I'll say the first, you know, few games, especially against the top teams, you know, you, you have a more of an understanding next time you play against them that, you know, when's the right time to sit off and when's the right time to press because, yeah. you know, one one opportunity is, you know, what these teams need, really, especially the the top four or five, it's such a uh, a harsh league, and that one mistake can lead to to a goal, and that can ultimately make you lose the game. So, um, yeah, I'd like to feel like you you know you learn that side of the game a lot better, and uh, experience definitely helps with that. Yeah, uh, last one does does Martin O'Neill come into your thinking when you're making a move like this? Do you? Is it the kind of thing where you, you, you ring an inter international manager and get some advice or is it just kind of, look, you know, that's, that's, it's sort of my own business and, and we'll talk down the line whenever I see an Irish camp? Um, I, didn't, I didn't speak to, to the manager, no, but I think it was, you know, an obvious sort of um, decision for me. You know, international-wise, it was, if I'm not playing for Bournemouth for I wasn't given the opportunities that I'd hoped, um, you know, based on the, the way last season went and, yeah, you know the manager made it quite clear that he can't afford to pick players that are not playing for months on end. And you know I was thankful for him in the summer to to pick me um, for the summer games because it was you know months before um, months after you know my my last game. Yeah. Um, so I, I personally feel if it got to the point where you know I hadn't played um, coming up to these games now. I wouldn't have expected it to be in the squad and, and probably he wouldn't have been able to physically put me in it anyway. I wouldn't mm. have been ready um, physically or, or mentally to, to play in such a such a big game. So mm. uh, naturally, I feel international-wise, I made the right decision yeah. um, in what I did. Yeah, because you, you played in the Paris game, didn't you? You played against France? 
I come on for 20 minutes against 20 minutes. France and, and 10 minutes against um, 10 minutes against uh, USA. But I, I, I was struggling before right. and I met up with the camp. I had a bit of a calf injury and um, there was a bit of confusion in um, not knowing I actually had the injury. The, the medical teams didn't pass the information on too well to, to the Irish medical team. So there was a bit of a confusion with that. Right. I know uh, it was just a friendly. Did you feel when you were looking at France that night or on the pitch against them that you were looking at, you know, kind of world champions in waiting? Was there a big gulf, big difference? Anything jump out at you about that game? Well, I think naturally when you look at the just the team sheet, you, you know the, how much quality they had just, just with the names they had. Yeah. Um, you know, it being a warm-up game, then I'm sure they wasn't full throttle, but the way they controlled and dictated the game, you, you knew you were playing against top, top players. Yeah. Um, to win a World Cup, you need more than that. They obviously had, you know, a good bond between the group. Um, and yeah, it was, um, I was really impressed with France throughout, to be honest, the World Cup. Even the, the first few games when they got, you know, was a bit criticised for the way they were playing. Mm. Um, for them to come back the way they did and, and not let the, the media or anyone affect them. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're worthy winners as well, Carl. Yeah. Listen, we'll let you go. Really good with your time. And, I mean, it was look, the, the Bournemouth period has been really successful for you on the whole from League One through until Premier League level. So the very best of luck with Cardiff. We might check in once or twice across the season. Best of luck with things. Tom, man, thank you very much. There you are. That was Harry Arder speaking to me earlier on, Dan. So he's made the move, wasn't content with being on the bench, wants first-team football. Cardiff seems like a move he's happy with where he'll get some game time and even just from an Irish point of view if nothing else to have a midfielder playing in the Premier League is not something that we're overly burdened down with No, look we're not really I mean you look at the weekend just gone there was there was eight Irish players involved in the Premier League and most of them uh, defenders you know and full backs now I know Arthur wasn't involved himself because of the terms of his loan deal mm. um, Shane Long wasn't picked by Southampton Robbie Brady still out injured Greg Cunningham was on the bench for Cardiff albeit a uh, Another defender, uh, so I mean there will be more involved across the season, but not not too much, not too much more. So, um, yeah, I, I think Arthur, you know, it, it was good that it, all the interest in him was Premier League. It seemed, you know, I'm sure there was interest from below that, but I mean his options seemed to be Premier League based, mm. and uh, he has a good reputation. You know, just looking at the reviews and like Cardiff fans seemed pretty happy to get him. They'd had a pretty quiet summer of activity, and. He's someone who's proved he can play Premier League. Like it's, yeah. it's obviously. I mean, I know obviously he's, he's touched on it there, and and I know Eddie Howe has also spoken about, uh, you know, how he still holds him in high regard. But for whatever reason, just you know, his his, his face didn't fit the second half of last season. And uh, but he but he's, you know, he he is a Premier League level player. I think you know he's he's been very effective at that level in the past, and he's probably quite suited to Cardiff. But to touch on your general point, yeah, I mean Jeff Hendrick did play for Burnley at the weekend. Um, you know, beyond that, I mean, James McCarthy is the other one who can come back actually at some point across the season. But well, the other we're one, not going into a long list. No, the other one, and I know you watched. Um, I know you you plonked down and watched both games on Sunday. Declan Rice did forty five minutes. Of course, yeah, yeah. and uh, certainly found the likes of Keita and Mane running around him is not as straightforward as it might first appear, and it doesn't appear very straightforward in the first place. No, he got a bit of a chase in all right, and he was taken off at half time. Now, I don't think you can judge him as a midfielder based on that game. I mean, Liverpool were patently superior in all areas of the pitch. However, it was a complete lesson for him because pretty much all of his games for West Ham last year were in a defensive role. And, OK, with Ireland, we, we've seen him, you know, snippets of him in midfield and also in the USA game where he was very good. But primarily, he's played most of his midfield football at age group level, at underage level. That's where he plays for in 21s. So this was like mm. an education. You hope that it's just... I mean, it made a bit of sense in some ways to try and get Wilshire a bit deeper and get him on the ball. And, and Rice was the one to sacrifice that he wasn't probably doing enough in terms of closing Liverpool down, which I assume was his brief, you mm. know, next to Noble. Um, but I still think, you know, I, I sort of posted up a, you know, sort of a tweet about it. It's like he was playing and a few comments after suggested, well, that's it, he can't play midfield at that level. I mean, that's just a bit, it's a bit I'm hasty. Sure. Yeah. Because we've seen with Ireland, actually, that really for the point you mentioned we don't have a huge amount of midfielders uh, and you know his positivity in there at times and trying the forward pass and just getting the team moving a bit might just be what Ireland need in that position certainly until if McCarthy came back at full tilt uh, you could see then he'd be very similar you know in terms of what he might do and um, 
you know, we, we, need, we need that type of player in a team, sort of presuming that you want Hendrick pushed on a bit further forward. I mean, Arthur is another player who would be very useful in there. We've got David Myler. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, Arthur, it's strange. His Irish career still hasn't fully, like, ignited, really. He yeah, had, like, the, the, the one good night in Cardiff where he played well, but the playoffs just didn't happen for him. You know, he was one of the players that, that struggled a bit. Um, and he's never really had a sustained run. Mm. So so maybe, you know, this this autumn in the Nations League and, and, and these games might be his chance to finally really put a run of four, five, six games together and show what he can do. As for the other game, Arsenal-Manchester City, it's been quite interesting to watch the fallout in that I think a lot of the frustration, the Arsene Wenger frustration, which was temporarily uh, eased and, 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 and taken care of for the summer, and then there was hope that Emery would come in and change things dramatically, is bubbled up again very, very quickly, I've noticed. So even, you know, Sam Allardyce yesterday talked about the, you know, this stupid passing, we're obsessed with it in this country, and that was, that was the thing. But Tony Adams like very quickly has got on Emery's case here and was saying, well, why is Peter Cech and Co? He shouldn't be. We bought a new keeper. And then why did he not just agree on the back four early on and whoever the two screening midfielders were going to be and actually work on this and just arrive ready to go? Instead, we're as muddled and Arsene Wenger-esque as ever. Like it was a, and like Adams was really angry. I was listening to the radio interview he gave. Really, like, you know, as if Emery's been making the same mistakes in a Wenger esque way for like seven years, years. and he's lost his way. Tether, it's almost as if very quickly the fact that the players were making, you know, appeared very similar to how they did under Wenger uh, has put Emery under the spotlight far quicker than any manager after one game. Yeah, I mean, I mean they were. There was spells either side of half time where they competitive, where they were reasonably competitive. But ultimately, like for a start to a new era, you have the, the ground empty and with a few minutes to go, and this was like a, a two 0 thrashing, really. You know, in every respect, as a show of strength from Man City side that was missing a good number of its best players. Mm. So it is interesting the point about you know the the Adams point about the defense and you know not having worked on something because one of the discussion points last week coming into the season was that well Emery's had compared to say to Sarri like Emery's had more time to work with his players yeah. he'd done some of his business reasonably earlier i think he'd like signed four or five players around world cup time you know yeah. so they weren't in a last minute scramble uh, whereas Chelsea have had a lot of instability say last week uh, so in that regard, I, I think you're entitled, you know, you're entitled to be a bit of criticism aimed in this direction. Mm. Uh, he did pick quite a young side and played young players in certain areas. And I, I think sometimes managers, when they do that, they assume there'll be a bit of understanding that this is the start of a project. I mean, look, at, um, I fancy these young players. You have to give them time. This is a tough education for them. But it wasn't really a statement. You know, it wasn't a statement to say this is what I'm bringing to, to the table here. Mm. Uh, and the fixture list hasn't been kind, but still, you, I think you're entitled to expect more without hitting into crisis mode. Yeah. I mean, you know, but like Arsenal, they've become so accustomed to crisis <laughs> mode that it doesn't take like, that long to flick towards default. Yeah. You know? And uh, there was always going to be a difficult adjustment period, but I, I, I don't think it, the criticism is ridiculous either. You know? I mean, it was you know, just on your own patch, to be comprehensively outplayed. Now, I'd still be of the view that Man City might do that to most teams most weeks, and it, that just may be it. Mm. But when you're looking for that big kickoff, early season optimism, it's not great to be dismantled no, that it's way. it's not uh, Marcelo Bielsa-esque, as no. we'll be talking about in a few moments' time. And uh, you mentioned City, it was like a show of strength. <laughs> they didn't even play that well. Like, you know, like they didn't... Like a six to seven out of ten? Yeah, of they didn't play that well. I mean, there was a brilliant 20 minutes at the start. Um, but I think the, the question with, with City, and, and it's a valid point, I mean, no team has retained the Premier League in ten years. Uh, Isn't that an extraordinary? It is, yeah. It's a, I, I, I mean, should be aware of it, but I was almost surprised when, it, when yeah. these pieces started popping up about it, that. So, oh, yeah. Like, even... That, like, that includes a chunk of a Ferguson era as well, yeah. you know, not to mention sort of, you know, the, the various eras. But obviously when City won the two league titles, it was still a bit like question marks over their managers. You know, as in Mancini wasn't hugely popular with the dressing room and had probably had a shelf life in terms of the fiery relationship he had. Pellegrini maybe just was he the strong leader. And also, I think the one concern you would have is that clearly there was questions about the desire of some of the players in the dressing room to press on. Mm -hmm. Similar to 
Chelsea when they have good year, bad year, good yeah. year, bad year. Um, we, we, we had nothing that felt anything approaching a dynasty. No, but with Pep, it does feel like they're building. And how do you tackle sort of desire and all these things? Well, if you're able to have a bench with Sané and De Bruyne, uh, with, with, with Silva to still come back into the squad, with Jesus on the bench, um, you know, Mares coming in, uh, any player that sort of is complacent, there, there's a penalty that they will they will pay. Mm. And okay, other teams, other title winning teams should have had that, but it just feels with City that it's not the end of a journey winning no. the league. It's more the, the sort of the the thirty percent stage of a journey, and that's that's what everyone else should be a bit worried about. Yeah, it's frightening, and there's basically no downsides to having competition for places. Except there was the one moment where I thought that is a player who is clinging on to his jersey or any minutes he can get in the jersey and that was when Aguero should have squared the ball for De Bruyne and he shot and I really think if he was assured of his place and he was in a if he was like more comfortable I think he I mean because he definitely saw De Bruyne he's too good not to I just think he thought I have to make a statement have to make a statement she's loses on the bench they're all coming yeah. back and that was a classic moment of somebody who knows the manager is looking for any reason to drop him and yeah well that's the thing I mean there was like huge speculation that Aguero just didn't fit the, the Guardiola plan yeah. at the start and, and Jesus was very much coming in to to, re- to replace him like I don't know that could be over analysing one incident a bit much but I, I do you know I take your point like that uh there is a certain pressure. And I don't think Mares was too impressed when he was coming off either as well. But I, I think, you know, <laughs> they've got options there to, to deal with that if, he, if he's having a bit of a lull. So, yeah, I, I, there, there's a few downsides. I mean, obviously Europe and all of that will give them, present them a challenge because that's something that he's obviously very intent on doing and there's an element of rotation and, and the management that comes with that, which is challenging. Yeah. But really beyond that, I mean, I'm a huge De Bruyne fan uh, and an injury to him, say, would be devastating but they're far more equipped than other sides to cope I mean if Salah gets to pick up a serious injury or Firmino even for Liverpool you're thinking they're really struggling here mm. whereas with City like Bernardo Silva has come on he started and it, it, it feels like in every position maybe Barr still defence that they're, they, they yeah. have a couple of options to cope with it for, for all the talk of how good Liverpool look and they do look really good they had a great year last year on the injury front Yeah, they really do need that to happen again but I mean geez, when everybody's fit they are, they are actually, they're going to swat teams aside throughout this year. But they were not, they were very good. Again, I mean, West Ham were poor, but Liverpool were good. And like, they dropped a lot of silly points at Anfield last year. As yeah. much as they were unbeaten, there were games where teams just sat in a bit and frustrated them. And, uh, you know, Kyle was good in terms of just picking up positions to ask the opposition defence a few more questions, you know, and, and sort of help to bring them out of position and stuff. So uh, they were they were striking. And yeah, I mean, they are a team you'd love to sit down and watch. Yeah. Um, but they still, I mean, they were 25 points behind, you know. And yeah. uh, you're just thinking, where are the games here where City are going to struggle? If they could go to Arsenal away, and that's probably, looks, you would think that should be one of the top six, seven most difficult fixtures of a season. And they made it look very routine coming off the back of the albeit meaningless sort of community shield but still mm. um, it, it doesn't look like there's any sense of the old second season syndrome here I, well no it's not second season for Pep but yeah. you know in terms of the, the title Pep hangover yeah, yeah yeah no it's certainly shaping up that way after weekend one the um, we'll take a short break the thing we wanted to touch on next was Marcelo Bielsa legendary coach we talked to Tim Vickery about him so many times he has so many disciples not least Guardiola and Simeone and he brought Pochettino through as a player and Pochettino seems to worship him as well and he has pitched up at Leeds and has made a really, really good start. They beat Stoke 3-1 in the first game. They whooped Derby 4-1 then. And it seems Bielsa is uh, proving a real hit. So we're going to talk to Adam Pope of the BBC over in Yorkshire next. Get in there. That's what I pay you for. I think conceit and arrogance is part of a man's makeup. Perhaps I've got too much. I believe in a different concept of football to Don. We don't play in the clouds. If God wanted us to play football in the clouds, he'd put grass there. That might mean, you know, aiming for utopia, and it might mean being a little bit stupid. But that is the way I am. And if anything is going to win second division this season, it's character. And I've got it.
with the faster than ever Boil Sports app. Multiples made easy and personalised content on every sport. Download it now. Boil Sports. Time to play. Moncrief. Dolphins, let's be frank. Dolphins are, are bastards. They, they are really bastards. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they like they've it's such good PR. Yeah, but really, they're evil. I know. It's just because yeah. they're so smart and yeah. can talk. Moncrief, sponsored by Avant Card. Back tomorrow from two p.m. on News Talk. Learning to drive? Make sure you get the most value from your driver training. Have your logbook completed by your RSA registered driving instructor after every essential driver training session. Then record your driving practice and any questions you might have for your instructor in your logbook. Finally, check that your instructor sends each EDT session record to the RSA. You can do this by visiting MyEDT on the RSA website. Essential driver training is your path to becoming a safe and socially responsible driver. To find out more, visit rsa.ie. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's not all fun and games being the dog in this family. The excuses I get when it's time for a run. It's lashing out. The beach is miles away. The dog ate the car keys. Well, they've got nothing to worry about. Sure, they've got AA car insurance. They can drive any car. Newsflash for you, listen to me. I only ate the key ring. And I'd do it again. With AA car insurance, our members get fully comprehensive insurance to drive other cars too. Go to the AA.ie and get €100 Euro off today. Who's got clever car insurance? Excludes value product. Minimum premium of €280. Euro. Acceptance criteria, terms and conditions apply. AA Ireland Limited Trading as AA Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. I'm Adam Shah, and I'm living proof that the MBA from NCI can give you an edge in your career. The MBA at National College of Ireland gives you a world-class qualification with expert faculty in a convenient IFSC location. Find out more at our Taste of an MBA event on Wednesday, August 15th from 6pm. Call 1850-221-721 or visit www.ncirl.ie. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Welcome back. So we've been wanting to check in on Marcelo Bielsa, who has made a fantastic start to life at Leeds. They beat Stoke 3 1 early doors and then uh, beat Frank Lampard's Derby County 4 1 and have been shaping up very, very nicely indeed. Bielsa is a bit of a legend in his own time. Earlier on, before the uh, Bolton game this evening, we spoke to Adam Pope of the BBC. And uh, Adam, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Dan. So, uh, Bielsa, as I said, is a bit of a legend in his own time. Newell's old boys, they've named the stadium off him. He managed them 30 years ago almost. And since then, he's been with Argentina and Chile and Atletico Bilbao and Marseille and Lazio and Lille. And his disciples are everybody from Guardiola to Simeone to Pochettino. So, I can imagine the excitement when word came through that Bielsa was rocking up at Leeds. <laughs> it was an incredibly ambitious appointment, which took a long time as well to, to get over the line. And that wasn't because of his sort of salary demands, which apparently was sorted out quite early, although we understand it's more than £2 million for making the highest paid you know, head coach in the history of Leeds, no doubt. But the fact that he wanted the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed and everything put in a certain way, because he is absolutely meticulous. And I think... His whole philosophy and his approach, not just to football, but what we're learning to life, is, is incredibly rigorous. And um, he totally believes in his conviction and how he wants to play. And he has a humility as well, which probably betrays all those sort of achievements and that sort of world renown that he has. You'd expect him to be a little bit more brash, brash if you like, but, but not at all. Very humble man, very cerebral, very intelligent. And is obviously, in the early part of this season, um, is getting his message across despite not being able to speak uh, English. Ah, well, you bring us on to that. So, I mean, one of the great interviews already of the season has arrived. <laughs> I mean, it was just fantastic stuff here. We've got, we've got a quick clip for people. This was Bielsa being interviewed after the uh, win against Stoke. Keith Andrews, uh, obviously involved with Sky, is a regular in the show here. He said it was quite difficult for Sky to even convince Bielsa to do this interview. I mean, this was painstaking work to get him to come out in front of the cameras. And when he came out, boy, did he give him everything. Marcelo, what are you expecting from your first game in English football? I am very excited and I'm happy to be here. I am very happy uh, that this begin. You'll have learned a lot about your squad over pre-season, but will you really find out about them today in a game against the title favourites? 
equipo durante la pretemporada. Ahora los va a conocer de verdad en la cancha. Y es. Eh, sí, lo que, lo que dice es cierto. Yes, you are right. Yes, you are right. Adam, I think we're all looking forward to your signature 45-minute sit-down with Bielsa sometime soon. <laughs> well, when we've sat down with him, we just get the response from the, through the translator. And because now the sort of furore around him has died down a little bit, you know, you haven't got as many foreign journalists come in to do, you know, feature pieces on him. The Premier League has started a course, so a lot of the journalists that have been in and asking questions have, have sort of stepped away. He's, he's starting to open up a little bit more. And he is absolutely fascinating because you can actually speak to him about the football in depth. He'll talk to you about how he wants to play and and uh, and what his philosophy is and also there's absolutely none of this sort of pretending that players aren't injured he'll actually name his squad for you more or less um who's going to play because he believes in what he's doing and he he really is refreshing to be quite honest with you so his english is better than that sky interview suggests oh totally he understands a lot more um, than what he's letting on because because i've noticed when you ask a question to the translator you can see him sort of nodding or reacting already yeah. but also he did tell us that his mum sent him to english lessons for about 15 years Yes, apparently he was 63, so it was obviously a long time ago when he was back in Argentina. So, yeah, but I think what it is with him is that he wants his message to be absolutely clear. He's very precise, and he doesn't want to dilute it or mess it up by getting the English wrong. If you see what I mean, so yeah. that's why he relies heavily on the translator. Uh, Adam, tell him, tell us a bit about his uh, attention to detail, because I think you, you mentioned the, the number of pieces that were sort of written about him before the start of the season, and we're reading stories of you know at the interview he was able to reel off lists of like championship formations and tactics and also uh, the double training sessions that have become the norm now. I mean, are, are you hearing sort of locally that these anecdotal tales are true and that the whole daily environment has changed? Absolutely. And I think just to show you uh, his attention to detail would be that he wanted certain changes making at the training ground. Um, and also when he went up to the training ground, he was literally... Bit, bit, bit old schoolish, you'd say, a bit like uh, your mother-in-law might have done at one point, would be to run their finger with a glove across surfaces to see if there's any dirt there, you know. So um, that's the sort of attention he's going to. You can tell in terms of the football, he watched, I think it was all 51 videos of the Leeds games from last season before sort of committing himself to the club. So he knew everything about every player that was already at the existing squad, um, which was quite incredible, the fact that he's sort of devoted that much time and effort to do that. He has completely immersed himself and he actually although he won't admit this because he says that it was a private matter but one of the national papers here said he wanted players to understand what it was like to earn um to work for a ticket for the price of a ticket so uh, allegedly he had them picking up litter around the training ground for three hours which was worked out that you know by the time they'd done that that was basically the amount of time it would take somebody to earn uh, the money to go and pay for a ticket to watch at ellen road yeah david heitner in the guardian that extraordinary uh, taught really the team mm -hmm. picking up litter for three hours I'm sure they were thrilled so <laughs> but he could get away with it that's the thing who well, else could get away with it very few yeah. and, and he's not afraid to walk away as we've seen at Marseille and Lazio I mean we've walked out on these clubs a game into a season or two games in if he feels that things aren't being done the way he likes them so a very very good start the Stoke game 3-1 a 4-1 win away to Derby Keith Andrews who I mentioned was in here talking after the Stoke game and he was at it and mm -hmm. said the football was everything he could have hoped for from a Bielsa team. The movement, the passing, the pressing. Uh, he said it was extraordinarily good. Give us your take on what you've seen thus far in the two games and how do these players, these same players largely, compare to what we're, they were producing last year? Yeah, uh, it's all those things that Keith has said. I've never seen a Leeds side in the sort of 12, 13 years that I've been covering them start so well and to a strategy and to a plan that was so effective. I know we're only two games in. So that is right. And, and the thing that is really interesting, he talks about a high press and you know, reclaiming possession high at the park whenever they can. They're doing that. The second goal against Derby, I think, was a perfect sort of reflection of the side that he wants to be. You know, Barry Douglas, who's been the one signing that's come in that's really played the, the first two games. The others haven't really played yet. Um, he reclaims the ball, delivers it beautifully. Alioski, who hasn't been able to put a cross in for the whole of last season of that quality, finds the head of Kemal Roof, who, who buries it. And you know, when you look at that, he's finding things from players or encouraging players um, to to behave or to, or to play in a way that... Um, that he's making them believe that they can do and that might be a bit more discipline for some players and I mentioned Alioski in particular and then for other players um, he's given them the license to do what they have to do or have them play out of position or what we might expect them to play 
uh, normally has them play out of position like midfielders and midfielders in the middle of defense like Calvin Phillips for instance so they can play out from the back so it's you know it's a bit of a total football sort of style if you like if, if, if you want to be a bit glib about it but he's certainly getting more out of these players than, than what we've seen in, in in the past sort of year or so whether they can sustain it is going to be the big question mm. I mean, Adam you, you mentioned you've been covering Leeds for about 12 or 13 years mm -hmm. and that's pretty much been an unhappy time in, in many ways you know yeah, well, is this the Adam, the, the Adam Pope <laughs> curse is that what this is called? yeah like, picked him up in the championship took him to League One for the first time <laughs> in, the, in the history yeah, yeah listen I, I I can relate to that having started covering the Irish team around 12, 13 years ago. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but but what I would say is, though, it has been obviously a draining time and you had the Chilino era and yeah. um, the associated sort of controversy. What has this done for the mood around the city, around the club, the general sort of atmosphere around the place? Well, let's have a look at an example for tonight. You know, they're playing Bolton Wanderers in the you know, Carabao Cup, the first round. Normally, these are, you know, weekly attended uh, games they thought they'd get 15,000 they're already talking about 20 21,000 and encouraging people to come down here you know to, to get the tickets early ahead of the game so it's creating that vibe there is a massive buzz and I think the biggest thing is a lot of people like you, like you're saying we've all seen this before good start say it seems to be built certainly on a plan and on a strategy that's effective and has been working over the summer and is you know from the office has worked straight away in terms of the championship and um, so so that that's good so what it's done is you've got this sort of seasoned fans that have been here for many, many years, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, seen it all through the great times and the difficult times. They're saying, we've never seen a start like this to the season. And when they're believing and they're the most sceptical of fans, then you know that maybe something could be beginning to happen. However, he has totally dismissed the idea that they should be named favourites for promotion after just two games. Mm. He says, whoever's asking that question doesn't believe it either. When you say that he's quite open to a chat about like his philosophy and about football generally, especially now that maybe the, the, the national kind of papers have, have mm. lost interest or written their think pieces for now, when you're chatting to him, how open is he? What does he say about the game? Are there any kind of anecdotes that give you a feel for him as a person to work with? Yeah, there is. We're sort of getting to know him a bit and he's sort of bit injecting a bit of humour into it. But what he says about the way it's, the game is played, he says, look, I will not alter my s style of play. And that is a high press, if you like, you know, lots of movement, win the ball back high up the pitch. Um, and that's, if, that's in the simplest one, that's how it is. He will yeah. not change uh, his philosophy. But then he will talk about individual players. If you say, look, you know, there's a new lad, Jamie Shackleton, who's just made his debut at the weekend or start tonight. And he, for example, they will talk about him and exactly what he brings to the party. And they will talk about him at length, about, you know, his dynamism or what he's able to do on the ball, what balance he brings to the game, you know, his passing abilities and stuff. So he's not afraid to go into, into real detail because he's got conviction in what he's doing. So I think as the season goes on, um, he will talk more and more. For example, captaincy. Liam Cooper has the captaincy this season. And he was asked, was that your choice? Why is he your captain? He said, I didn't choose him. The players have chosen him. But I would say this. He said that Liam Cooper is an excellent captain. But he is the player's representative, not my representative. However, they've made a good choice. So quite a refreshing and different view of football in many, many ways. Mm. And, and I'd say of life as well. He's a real deep thinker and, uh, and a very humble man really humble man and I'm, I'm impressed with that if you're looking out for him anyone, anyone watching Leeds over the next while you'll see uh, his I think he's brought eight in total but you'll see his coaching staff on the sidelines <laughs> pointing and jumping up and down and pulling players this way and that way and, and, and gesticulating the whole time uh, Bielsa is the bloke sitting on the blue bucket that's right <laughs> he's the one which he says um, he's really surprised that the headlines of that has made um, but it gives him a better vantage point he says than sitting in the dugout um, and we've seen it you know it's become something of a well I think it's going to be something of a, a retail hit in the club shop here at Ellen Road I would have thought before too long but uh, Sorry, that's they're, why they're, they're now it. selling blue buckets in the merchandise the, shop or, or they will be doing they have said the, I know the Angus Kinnear the, the MD said look no, this, this will definitely be happening so uh, <laughs> just went to see which sponsor puts his name on it as well well, what, so, uh, what's a fair price for a blue bucket these days, a Bielsa uh, bucket? I tell you what, it will be priceless if they go all the way <laughs> this season, wouldn't it? But uh, 19.99 yeah. for a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> but incredible.
Cool. Um, yeah, so he has his own. He has his own ways, his own intricacies, if you like, and his and his quirks. But his uh, yeah, you're right about his staff, and he has plenty of them. They um, <laughs> they seem to uh, run run a little bit in fear of him. And then one of them, of course, you will have seen for that first game of the season was actually in the opposite stand. Um, to where he was in the dugout shouting out instructions which is totally within the uh, the laws of the game yeah. to uh, to the players that at that point were on the left side of the pitch so uh, Barry Douglas and uh, and Gianni Alioski so yeah he's he's unconventional it's definite that's that's, that, that's a definite yeah okay look exciting times to come and nine games in last season Leeds were top and then fell away so I, I guess the hope is that Bielsa sustains this and, and all the running stats are off the charts at the moment so we have to see if that's sustainable yeah. as well but I mean geez the thought of Bielsa with Leeds back in the Premier League that is a tasty one it is a tasty one, and you say we are, and you make that. That's the perfect point. Nine games in last year, they were, you know, unbeaten, going really well. They went to Millwall. We sort of warned the head coach at the time, Thomas Christensen. Look, this is a different game, and they go, no, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. We know what to expect. We've all played in front of big crowds. It says no, it's not the big crowd. It's just that it's Millwall, and and at that point, they got found out. Hopefully, the players that he's now got, who've had that year's experience of the championship under their under their belt, will actually be better equipped to deal with those sorts of situations. But you've got to say this: he's beaten two squads that are, you would say, amongst the favourites or certainly stoked to be right up there at the end of the season. Yeah. Last year they beat weak teams that, that either went down or, or were struggling. OK, great. We must check them out. We'll, um, we'll certainly be watching the next time they're on the box. And the people of Yorkshire praying that the Adam Pope BBC curse is finally lifted <laughs> by Bielsa. It's, it's exciting times. <laughs> Thank you. It is. It's, it's good. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And, uh, you know, another... Um, yeah, uh, it's about time they got out of this division, there's no mm. doubt. Is it going to be this season? At the beginning of it, I wouldn't have expected it. So, so I'm not saying nothing, guys. OK, thanks, Adam. Cheers. Cheers. Off the ball. On News Talk. The Eason Book Club on the Pat Kenny Show. This month, Eason recommended four books for us. The Shepherd's Hut by Tim Winton, The Devil's Half Mile by Paddy Hirsch, Hold by Michael Donkar, and our Eason Book Club Book of the Month for August, You Were Made for This by Michael Sachs. In an idyllic house in a Swedish wood, Mary and her husband are building their new dream life with their young baby, far away from events that overshadowed their old life in New York. When Mary's childhood friend Francis comes to stay, Francis barely recognises her old friend Mary, pureeing baby food, baking, living the Swedish dream. But little by little, cracks begin to show in her carefully constructed fairy tale, and Francis starts to see things others might miss. A terrible tragedy unfolds. We'll be reviewing the book from cover to cover on Thursday, August 16th, with Mary O'Rourke, Brian Kennedy and Catherine Lynch. The Eason Book Club on The Pat Kenny Show. Sharing book recommendations with book lovers every month. Do join us and discover more at newstalk.com forward slash Eason's Book Club. At Centra, we're celebrating summer with fantastic offers across the store. Make mealtimes easy with our mix and match everyday favourites meat range, three for ten euro. Selected fresh fruit and veg, three for two euro. And we have great summer wine offers like Connoisseur Bicicletta Sauvignon Blanc, only nine euro. Centra, live every day. Enjoy call sensibly. Join us on the 25th of September at Parky Cueve and pay tribute to one of Ireland's finest sports stars, the late great Lee Miller. Manchester United legends including Ryan Giggs and Paul Scholes, led by Roy Keane, go head-to-head with a star-studded Republic